if there are questions, then that that's something that we have to remove the item for. If they're just quick questions, we can leave it on consent. Um, if it turns into a discussion, I'd recommend removing it. Are they just quick questions? Uh, they should be. Okay. Okay. Which one was it? A management update. Oh, management update. So um, under the management update, um, page 13, status report, Geo geographic info systems, number eight, planning, um, uh, num item number three. Plans for a new aerial imagery flight in 2025 are in progress. I just wanted, I didn't know about that. I was just wanting more info. I can answer that. Yes. The, uh, the county coordinates um, aerial uh, photographs, and, and we are one of the agencies that participates in that effort, and so we pay a share into that, a relatively small share considering the, the overall benefit that we gain from using that data, and it's, it's basically purchased data that it's not a hosted data like Google aerial photos or anything like that. It's an actual airplane that gets flown over the county. And so it's, they try to do it every three years or so. Every three years? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, my other quick question is um, uh, same page, but it's number 10 miscellaneous, item four. And it's um, engineering staff is participating in the county's well ordinance technical advisory committee. The group is providing input to the county public health staff on revisions to their well ordinance, blah, blah. I was just wondering, is this new? I, I wasn't aware of this. If anyone could elaborate a little on that. Sure, I can elaborate on this. This is uh, something that the county of Santa Cruz has been having on their list of to-do items is to update the county well ordinance. So it was presented, uh, some of the information was presented at the last MGA, Sierra Ryan presented that. And as part of that um, ordinance review and kind of update, they established a technical advisory committee. So we did have staff um, attend on behalf of the district and provide some comments and input along the way. And then Sierra will actually be presenting on the county well ordinance here in December. Excellent. Great. Thank you so much. Oh, I just wanted one other comment. Um, it'll take one second. Wanted to thank you for the new admin GM section. That was really um, helpful and communication is the key. So I just really appreciate that. Thank you. Anyone else? Tom? No? Um, no, I'm okay. Thank you. I mean, there's, I think I, um, at some point would maybe like to sit down with Melanie or Taj and just kind of engineering, particularly just get updates. You know, I think it's great. I love the update, but I mean, some, I have little details on little things. So I'm no, I don't need anything now. Okay. Well, I know. Um, yeah, I noticed that there's a lot more detail in this. And my first reaction was, I don't know if I need all this detail. And then my second reaction was, if it's not, um, it might be easier on staff to give all the detail than to call out what they think is important. Um, so I'm okay with it as long as it's not, you know, burdening the staff. And since Tom didn't say it, I have to say it for him. Uh, there's some acronyms in there that aren't defined, like whiskey and SCADA, which I know, but others won't. Thank okay. you. Any, uh, so it is, if there's nothing else on that and we're not pulling any other uh, items, um, is there a motion? I'll move. I'll second. Okay, we have to do roll call because Tom's there. Yes, I'm going to go ahead and start with you, Director LaHue. Yes. Director Balboni. Yes. Director Christensen. Yes. And President Jaffe. Yes. Okay. So that brings us to oral and written communications. There are there is one public member, but she's going to be speaking later. Welcome, Heidi. Um, so 
unless you have something hiding, then there's, um, you're not going to want to give three minutes of public comment. Is there anything that directors oh, want to um, talk to? Seeing none. Uh, we'll move on to reports, Mr. Council. Uh, thanks, President Jaffe. Um, actually, no report this evening. It's just nice to be here and see everyone. Thank you. Good to see you in person, too. Um, okay, so that brings us to that administrative business. So under conditional and unconditional will serve letters, there is one, a conditional will serve letter for a 19-unit motel, 270 North Avenue, Aptos. And... Is that you, Taj? I will take that one. Some of you may remember this. This has been in front of the board previously. Um, and the project, you know, has not changed since the previous presentation. Um, this is in Seacliff, and it is uh, an empty lot currently, and they are, um, the developer is proposing to build a 19-room um, hotel with um, a little apartment for the manager and a little conference center. We're unclear. It's not likely that there'd be any infrastructure required to serve it. There is a water main on this street. And so we will, so their, their previous conditional will serve approval has expired. And so we're starting over. They did repay uh, the will serve fee and, um, you know, we'll, we'll walk them through the process. They need this to go to the next step at the county. Okay. It is the same developer, yes. Yes, I remember. All right. Public comment? Seeing none. Any questions or comments, discussion by directors? I just have one point on education. <laughs> And that's about the black backflow pre prevention. It says it's not required during construction. I'm just curious why um, don't they need water at a construction site? Oh, yes, it would be required for it'll be required when they're finished for sure. It's a commercial oh, establishment, right. but during construction, if they do, we will have they'll likely put in a temporary backflow device. Oh, okay. Yeah. That is, that will be a requirement. Um, we haven't sent this letter out, so if if, it, if that checklist is is confusing, I'll I'll update it. Yeah, I can sound like they only need it to get signed off on the, on the construction, so that would be. And then the other thing is, it says a recommended the green credit application. I know how many how many of our applications have? Do we know how many have signed up for the? Carla, could you please talk into your microphone? I can't hear you. Sorry. I said I was just curious whether you had an idea of how many people do actually go for the green green credit application. So, Shelley, is that something you administer or is that you don't mean green building, but you mean our green what did I credit? say? Oh, I was just... Oh, so... So let me clarify, this uh, attachment four is from 2019. Oh. And since then, the district has ended that program. So the checklist is actually, the, the new checklist that will be issued tomorrow won't have that. Won't even have it. No, it won't. It's, it's been removed from the ones that go out. Oh, so we don't even require that at all anymore. The no. county might require something. Yeah. I just feel like it's. It was still. I thought it was still floating around. Nope. If, if you have anything to add. The county does require compliance with the California Green Building Code for fixtures and and whatnot, and so do we. Um, so does the district. So we have so a water efficiency checklist and we also have a landscape requirements checklist where 
they have to uh, comply with that for all new development. And a commercial development like this would have a dedicated irrigation meter, so there's better accountability for water use. They would have to meet the model water efficient landscape ordinance and our requirements. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's, well, I'm actually relieved because I couldn't remember. It's been a while since we had a well served discussion, <laughs> and I forgot. Um, so, but I did, I did think that we would, it just became part of the. It was nothing special for anybody to do. It's just a requirement. Is that right? Okay. Okay. Any other discussion questions? Uh, quickie questions. Um, this is the property that's a three story hotel, right, Taj? I don't know how many stories it is. I could tell you how many rooms it is. <laughs> okay, I think it's the three story and it backs up to the railroad tracks uh, and the Coastlands property. It's, yeah. That is the location, yes. Okay, and then I was just curious about the delay. Why is it delayed? It's out of our control. Uh, it, it's not our delay. Um, maybe something at the county, maybe during I don't know. It's the applicant's delay, not ours. Yeah, no, I understand. Okay. I just, I remember that um, people in the area did not, want, did not want three stories. They wanted the two story and there was some thing about that, but I'm, I'm not, I can't remember exactly. I thought maybe you'd know about that. It's not a big deal. Just a quick question. This is, that would be at the county level. Okay. Yeah, the, the, the description is parking underneath the two floors of rooms, so it would be parking and then so three, yeah, so okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they were planning to put the parking down underground or if it was parking. So it, it may be two stories, maybe they've adjusted it a little outside of our purview. It certainly is more attractive, I think, the developers now that there's no longer a WDO and, <laughs> and water capacity fees maybe be changing as well so that might be what triggered the push we don't know could be other things okay tom anything no nope. all right well does somebody want to make a motion okay i'll make a motion motion <laughs> <laughs> easy to get through now <laughs> So your motion is to approve this additional additional wall service. Okay. So number one. I can't, I couldn't find the original where it is because like, I scanned page thirty-eight. Thirty-eight. Back at, yeah. Is there a second? All, All second. second. Oh, go ahead, Tom. Give it to Tom. He's <laughs> all right. Roll call. Director LaHue? Yes. Director Balboni? Yeah. Director Christensen? Yes. And President Jaffe? Yes. Okay. So that brings us to 7.2 consider approval of variance requests from Ordinance 24 02, Section 4G, low pressure at 3363 Cunnington Lane, SoCal. That's you, Taj, again. That is me again. Yeah, these are unique situations, and uh, therefore we're you know, proposing a variance uh, at this time, you know, when, when this ordinance is back up for a discussion in the future, we may, you know, reconsider this section of this ordinance. But as of now, we're just asking for a, a variance. Um, and the, the section of the ordinance 24-02, section 4G, um, basically prohibits serving a fire sprinkler system through anything but a dedicated fire service. And the unique situation in residential fires, this is a, for a single family residence, um, is that we have a uh, fire service and then we have a, a dedicated uh, domestic service when there's a low pressure situation, uh, they usually, the builder or homeowner puts in a booster pump to raise the pressure. 
and the fire department wants uh, one fire pump, not two. And so, you know, you get into a very complex situation when we have two meters that need to be accurately monitored and only one pump. And so they have their solution, the, the builder's solution, and the fire marshal has approved this, and the fire sprinkler system contractor has designed it, is to put an on-site tank, um, I believe it's it's at least 1,000 gallons, that will be filled and, and it'll be their storage to draw off of with a booster pump. Um, and therefore, they don't need... And in order to meter that accurately, it'll be a combined booster pump for fire and domestic. So um, we are, it's a, like a five eighths inch domestic meter. And so the, the variance would be to allow um, the property to serve both fire and domestic use from one domestic meter. And, and Steph, you know, recommends this this variance in this very unique situation. It's usually where there's homes being new homes being built at a high elevation. Um, I think in the report it states that the pressure is about 30 psi without a booster pump. Okay. So I I am available to answer any further questions or additional questions you might have. Before we do that, just. Um, any comment from the public? Seeing none. Okay. Questions, discussions? Um, two very quick questions. Just one is that um, on the, um, in that area, that's not the highest elevation house. So I'm wondering why that one has a problem. But anyway, um, I just wanted to be clear that um, the homeowners paying for the thousand gallon tank for the meter and for the water. That's cor that's okay. correct. Great. And it's a very good question. Um, at this is the highest house being served off of this pressure zone. Uh, up the hill, if you've you've explored that, um, there are some additional homes that are our customers. Uh, they are fed from a very small water main that comes across from above uh, from fairway drive and it's it's not a uh, size to add this house to and there's actually a disconnect between those homes um, and so we will uh, have to further explore how to serve the large property adjacent or across the road from this also known as the Erlach property it's a it's been a proposed location for very high density developments. And so we'll attack that at that point. Um, but in this instance, it is the highest um, water main for that pressure zone. And that's available for this customer. The other water main is not available. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions, discussions? Carla, Tom? No, thank you. I, I assume, Taj, that at some point you guys would look into using that higher source, uh, you know, higher elevation source and then putting in just a larger main to serve all those places or what would be the solution eventually? Um, to serve the, the large lot? Yeah, yeah. The Erlac property? Um, yes, it would, it would likely be... Um, the developer's responsibility to obtain easements through um, a, a private driveway and bringing in a larger water main up down from fairway. The other opportunity is bringing up a, you know, a water main from Soquel. We do have a higher pressure main down in Soquel, but it's about the same distance. And so there's a couple different options, but we really need to wait to see what, what's ever in the future for that lot. Okay. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Yeah, just a comment. It seems like kind of a nice resource to have a tank there, too. <laughs> I don't know. In, in case of emergency. Uh, other than a fire. I guess but, it would be a private tank, though, so. True, but it's still there <laughs> for fires and things. 
Yeah, it's a it's it's only it's sized for um an in interior fire. It's not meant for a wildland fire or anything. It's a thousand gallons is not very um it's suitable for an interior a couple sprinkler heads. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's a variance, but sometimes variance have been asked for before. Is, is there any precedent for this variance? No. Okay. And the other question, um, I was. It was good to hear that the uh, fire fire marshal approves of this. Um, Josh, is there anything we have to be aware of if we give this variance that is exposure to the district? I mean, the short answer is no. There, there actually in the government code is an immunity um, for situations like this in which uh, it's possible that we may not be able to provide adequate flow in a fire situation. Um, in those cases, the public agency is not responsible. Okay. Those were my questions. And then, yeah, that's all I had, really. So if there's no more discussion, um, does anybody want to make a motion? Yeah. By motion, approve the variance from Ordinance 24-02, Section 4G, prohibiting fire protection equipment such as hydrants or fire sprinklers to be served by a domestic irrigation commercial or any other service other than a dedicated fire service. This variance applies to 3363 Cunnison Lane, SoCal, and is granted due to a low pressure, pressure situation. All right. You're going to add in the APN to the motion. I think that they want to see an APN. You good with that? Okay. Just nodded yes. Okay. okay. Uh, is there a second? I'll second it. <laughs> Are there seconds? Roll call. Director LaHue. Yes. Director Balboni. Yes. Director Christensen. Yes. President Jaffe. Yes. All right. Well, that brings us to something I'm looking forward to very much. Um, We're going to do a, a little shift with Heidi and Shelly coming up right now. Okay. So we're now on administrative business 7.3, received presentation on the city of Santa Cruz water supply augmentation imp implementation plan. And I don't know how to say the acronym. WhatsApp. WhatsApp. WhatsApp with the I. What's that? It's almost like WhatsApp. Yeah, so tonight we're happy to have Heidi Luckenbach here. Heidi's the water director for the city of Santa Cruz water department. She's going to be giving an update on the city's WASAP plan. Um, that's their long-range plan that identifies different water supply portfolios to help them close a water supply gap by 2031 uh, and address challenges with drought conditions, climate change, and water reliability. She's also going to be uh, giving a, 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 not an update, but tying in how their WASAP plan um, is working um, in collaboration with the regional water optimization study um, that we're partnering together on. So, Thank you, Shelley, and thank you for having me this evening. Um, we are going to violate the acronym rule here for sure, as we already have with the WASAP, because um, we also have WASAC and WASAC. There are many different. So please put a halt on me if you need um, a definition with the acronym. Um, this is a modified presentation to one that we delivered to the Water Commission last week where Shelley and Melanie attended. Um, Melanie asked if we could come and present to you today, and by we, she also asked if Claudia with Kennedy Jenks could come as well. You can see I have Claudia on here. She developed this presentation. Um, I wanted to kind of keep Claudia. Claudia is the project engineer on this, and I wanted to make sure that this conversation can stay a little bit higher level 
we're, and as you'll see, we're not ready yet to talk costs and volumes and things like that. So I wanted to make sure that we're really just getting an understanding of the connection, as Shelley said, between the optimization study and the water supply augmentation implementation plan, our schedule, some of the questions that we're still asking ourselves and any partners um, that you'll see that we're pursuing in the plan. And then at future meetings as appropriate, we'll bring in more from the project team. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so again, I'm just going to go through the, and I'm going to use WASAP from now on, the schedule and the process, how it fits with the optimization study. And then I'm going to talk about portfolios. The city is looking at three different portfolios that utilize portions of the findings from the optimization study. And again, our next steps. You do Quick question. Yeah. Um, are there slides I'm supposed to be seeing? All I see is a top of an agenda. You need to share the screen, I believe. Director LeHue, if you could just hold on just a moment, we need to share the screen with you. Okay, thanks. That looks more like what I was expecting. <laughs> Thank you. You did look puzzled. <laughs> I know, I was like, well, I'm sure I'm missing something here. Because this is the, one of the important slides, I think, because it describes how the optimization study fits into the work, the broader work that the city is doing. Um, in the top left, and if I use my mouse, is that at all helpful? Um, yeah, you can move the bar somehow. Oh, I don't know how to do that. Yeah. Right here. Yeah. I'm here, but I don't he didn't hear anybody for a minute there. Okay. But you can see the slide. Okay. Slides, but no audio now. Can you hear us now? There you go. Wonderful. Um, so in the upper left-hand corner of the screen is what we're showing as the pieces of the optimization study. Um, picking up the group one and group two projects from the GSP. We have ASR in the Mid-County Basin, IPR in the Mid-County Basin, and water transfers and exchanges just between the city and SoCal Creek Water District. The city also participates in a groundwater sustainability agency in the Santa Margarita Basin, and we're doing a similar effort in that basin, but not to the same level of detail that we are in the Mid-County. But we are looking at, again, ASR, IPR transfers and exchanges. Um, and to that, the work that Kenny Jenks is doing. Can I ask a, a question? Of course. So the IPR, that's indirect potable reuse, right? Yes. So I understand for the for our basin, but what's the source for the Santa Margarita of IPR? Yeah, great question. Um, City of Scotts Valley does operate a small wastewater treatment plant, and when this effort and the graphic was developed, we were working with them to see if we could either treat that water in Scotts Valley or take the um, that water and treat it at the city's wastewater treatment plant and then send that water up to Scotts Valley. And we can see the inefficiencies in that. So at this time, we're not no longer looking at IPR in the Santa Margarita Basin, largely because the volumes aren't there and the elevation is such that the pumping the water up the hill has just becomes really inefficient. Okay, thank you. Um, so the work that KJ is doing in the WASAP is also adding to the portfolios direct potable reuse, desalination, and then combining the inner ties with SoCal and Scotts Valley. With respect to the DPR project, we looked at a number of different location alternatives. One is partnering with SoCal at the Pure Water SoCal site 
and treating the water and putting it directly into the distribution system in that part of our service area. We're also looking at doing a similar treatment effort at the city's wastewater treatment plant and putting it into the distribution system over there and kind of recognizing um, wanting to socialize this alternative in the community. We're also looking at sending that treated water back up to our surface water treatment plant. Is someone talking? I don't hear anyone. <laughs> We're just talking amongst ourselves. We change, I'm having okay. troubles changing the screen, but I've moved on to the next screen. Okay, um, can a quick question then while I got you. Um, can you, I, I'm, maybe I missed something, but the difference between transfers and exchanges? Um, this, this is language that we developed a long time ago where it had a meaning for the city in our modeling of the confluence water supply model. I don't view it as a distinction anymore. Um, at that time, it was a transfer was a water of a um, sending water outside of the city service area, and it could come back. It, transfers could happen in either direction. The exchanges was a formalized agreement around that. So, the the meaning or the power of the exchanges is that you had more of a volume certain. So you could be thinking about it more with respect to supply reliability or passive groundwater recharge. Um, but but you're, I think you're right in calling that out because anymore it doesn't really have a distinction for us. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So the slide is just showing the components of the optimization study. Um, again, just the group one and group two projects in that GSP looking at the city's belts groundwater system, including um, Bells Falls 8, 9 is down here at the bottom, uh, 12 and 10. And then it also contemplates two new ASR wells in the area around the Capitola Mall. And then of course the Pure Water SoCal project, both at the current 1,500 acre feet per year, but also at a future planned production of 3,000 acre feet per year. I will point out that these two um, notes here, a little bit misleading because we all know the inner tie is here. Some of this pipeline work, as you know, was just needed as part of um, a broader transfer project to, I think, help the hydraulics in the district service area. So that's the optimization study, and this slide is showing you, and then the slide that was handed out for you, um, which maybe Tom does not have. Director Lee, he does not have, but this slide is showing when we looked at four different alternatives in the um, optimization study, we came up with a cost and then how much of the city's supply gap the project filled. So the optimization study's first priority is to fill the basin and meet the requirements of the GSP. Secondarily to that is to see how much each alternative could fill the city's supply gap. And on the slide in front of you, you can see it goes from about 70% thereabouts up to 100% for this final alternative. Um, we've been asked, and it's a great question, why wouldn't you stop here if you knew that you could solve the problem with this alternative um, from the optimization study? And the response is that the city has um, these other water supply opportunities. One is a pipeline with Scotts Valley that we're currently, um, well, we're currently contracting for to construct. So that's one reason. Um, this project relies solely on surface water. This alternative relies solely on surface water and um, wastewater from the city's wastewater treatment facility. And both of those are source limited, and we're trying to better understand what that limitation is. Um, so it just opens up for the city the opportunity to broaden our portfolio even further with um, recycled water, additional transfers, and then potentially desalination remains on the table. So I wanted to provide a slide that just summarized the... Heidi, do you mind going back? Yeah. Um, so you said alternatives C and D uh, rely only on surface water. 
but the orange color is transfers. So I don't understand the slide. Sure. Um, so the blue is all ASR water, and that's entirely surface water for the city. Gotcha. And so there is source limit potential source limitations there without knowing exactly what climate change is going to do. The transfers, um, we are we are saying it is potentially source limited because we don't know what volumes long term will be available from the city's wastewater treatment plant. Okay. Um, and so while we're increase, we're either utilizing pure water SoCal at 1500 acre feet or increasing it, it's being characterized here as transfers. Okay. We're just, yeah. And then since you had the slide up, the numbers, 150, $153, that's some cost. Yeah, and to be to be perfectly clear, those are these numbers over here with this million. Oh. Okay. <laughs> um, and so it's intended to be relative cost. Now these are very undeveloped projects. Sure, I understand. Um, very unlike the Pure Water SoCal project, and we put some disclaimers here at the bottom. I pulled out all the costs from this presentation, um, largely because we're not really comparing apples to apples um, when we're bringing in Pure Water SoCal. But I think it's good to see that, um, you know, these two projects uh, or alternatives fill 100% of the city's water supply gap through ASR, IPR, and water transfers to the city. So there's good opportunity out there. Um, so what we did then from the optimization study is take the findings and fold them into portfolios that added to them these other options for the city. So portfolio one um, really focuses on optimizing what's available with existing sources, projects, and infrastructure. So it adds to, um, it leaves the inner tie between the city and Scotts Valley, city and SoCal Creek at the current design size. Some of the optimization alternatives have the district sending to the city up to five MGD. And this portfolio leaves it at the one to 1.1 MGD. Again, just really trying to optimize um, and make the highest and best use, I guess, of the available water resources and infrastructure. It adds to that the city's transfers to and from Scotts Valley. And currently, this is this transfer is also between one and one point five MGD. Portfolio two removes um, water transfers with SoCal Creek Water District and adds to the mix direct potable reuse, like we described earlier. And then portfolio three removes DPR, keeps transfers with SoCal off the table and adds in desalination. And all of this is based on the um, council policy adopted in 2022 that said continue to look at all of these different alternatives. And Heidi, were there cost estimates, ballparks with any of those? There's cost estimates for all of it, yeah. And, um, and some of them, we have like a plus minus 50% without, mm -hmm. and then we're comparing it with Pure Water SoCal, which is pretty honed in at this point. Um, so we did leave them off. We do have cost estimates. The other, the other item that we have uncertainty around is um, if we partnered with SoCal Creek on a 1,500 acre foot Pure Water SoCal project, what is the negotiated price? And some of that work is happening right now in the optimization study with Professor Brent Haddad. Um, right. But there's a lot of options. Is it a take or pay? Is it a unit cost at a commercial rate? Is it buy-in? So there's a lot of options that we didn't want at this point in the city's development to put any of that in there without really understanding the direction this could go. Sure, I mean, that's gonna take some discussion and research and working through over some time. Yeah. Um, 
Um, so just graphically, this is portfolio one. And for each portfolio, we did project. Um, just again, showing tell transfer to the South Valley. And then looking at two different sites. This graphic, you're going to see this graphic for each portfolio, and it has animation, but we're not showing that right now. But it's just trying to, what it's showing is all of the city's water resources and highlighting with the cyan color and numbers which source we're using for this alternative. And you'll see this sort of slide for each one as well. So this is portfolio one. And this is the different scale of, so ASR, we, we change the size and scale of an ASR project. We change the size of transfers. And we change the size of transfers with Scotts Valley. So just trying to maximize each of the resources. Um, we've done groundwater modeling. We've done source water supply modeling for the city's surface water sources and groundwater modeling to understand how each of these would perform. Um, and then this is the percentage of the gap that is filled by the city, for the city. Um, Are the transfers, I, I know very little about the transfers with Scotts Valley. Are those uh, climate dependent? Whereas the SoCal, you know, water SoCal's they are. climate independent. Yeah, and they're very much climate dependent because not only are we um, constrained by climate and so what is your in-stream flow, but in our negotiated agreements with the state for our habitat conservation plan, we have in there that we would not transfer in, we have five climate year types and in the two driest, we've agreed to not send water outside the, the city service area. So it's their surface water transfers is definitely constrained out of the city service area. And ASR is also constrained in that driest year. We've agreed to not do ASR in that driest year also, which also makes sense because it's in that year that we need to be drawing from right. the ASR. Yeah. This is the direct potable project. So it, you can see it eliminates the um, Pure Water SoCal project and it just adds to it a advanced purification facility in the city service area. And this again is just highlighting the fact that we're no longer doing the inner tie with SoCal Creek Water District. So it's not highlighted, but we are highlighting the advanced water purification facility in the city. And these two are kind of more your independent projects. They are independent. Um, we had a comment, though, at the Water Commission meeting last week where the commissioner noted that in the desal, desalination portfolio, how much projecting are we doing with respect to what other agencies might need? in the future. In other words, Scotts Valley or San Lorenzo Valley. And, and we know through the work that we've done that um, we're threading a needle with optimizing water coming through the city's wastewater treatment plant. And the 3,000 acre foot would pretty much max that out. Um, we would definitely have some more water on the shoulder in the winter time to, to add to that supply. Um, but it's not unlimited. And desalination would provide opportunities down the road should climate be such that we needed to help our neighbors up in the Scotts Valley or San Lorenzo Valley. We have not talked at all with them about that concept, and this was the first time it's been brought up, but I thought it was an interesting observation. So that's the DPR one, and then reiterating again the desalination one. Same configuration for... ASR wells, transfers to and from Scotts Valley, and then a, a desalination project. I'm not going to go through that. Um, and you'll see we did six different alternatives where we modified the size of a desalination project. 
and ASR and water transfers. Um, and when we when we do get to costs, um, well, let me back up. Um, one of the reasons we took costs out is because we're we're trying to focus on a couple things. According to the policy, they're pretty in 2022. There's date certain of when we're supposed to have supply reliability, and and that's 2032, which is right around the corner in project planning. Um, but also, I think the issues of establishing agreements interagencies or um, any kind of water right agreements that may come up, interagency agreements, cost agreement, cost sharing agreements, and kind of grappling with that source limitation, I think is gonna be a big topic. So do you want to design something that could be expandable or do you want to, or not, or you want, you feel comfortable with the planning that we've done with respect to climate change to build ASR and expand Pure Water SoCal? So to me, those are the, the issues that we really have to grapple with now, not ignoring costs, but knowing that the projects are between $150 million and $500 million, and they fill between 70% and 100%, but they have these other criteria that we really need to be thinking through. I think that's a good approach, because you don't know what grant money is available. And <clears throat> Cost is a reality, but it's a changing reality. Yeah. Yeah. So back on that slide, there was uh, alternatives with and without ASR. What's the thinking on that? ASR is not inexpensive. Um, we, in the optimization study right now, we have two wells, our Bells Wells 8 and 12, that were in um, the grant for converting to ASR, and the city received $1.6 million to do that, and the cost estimate for both of them is nine. Gotcha. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, I just, I wanted to show this, it does show some cost, but I think it's really interesting comparison of the capital cost with water supply reliability. Um, I, maybe not, but this is, uh, um, you know, if, if money was unlimited and we could build anything, maybe we would be over here. Um, and it's not surprising that the ASR, IPR, water transfer projects are in here. Um, we're also going to create this sort of graphic to highlight some of those other pieces, the... Um, the, rely, the real reliability, the source water limitations, or the, the timing it could take to implement the project. So if you're going to do, by example, a desalination project, is it taking you 20 years? Maybe you have full uh, reliability and you're closing your gap, but when you look at it on that time scale, you'll be able to see a differentiation in the projects. So is it, right. is it a longer right. timeline? primarily because of all the environmental review and like trying to figure out where an intake structure would be and things like that? I think um, I haven't had conversations at the state level for a long time on desal. I do still think that is going to take a lot of um, conversation around purpose and need for supply reliability and momentum to convey that we've thoroughly analyzed the project and that this is the project that the region needs. Um, I don't foresee us, we did such an exhaustive study previously on surface and subsurface intakes. I don't, besides going much further offshore, I'm not seeing a lot of different alternatives or locations to consider. Um, so at least where I, my point of view right now is that it's really a conversation with state and federal regulators. Okay, thanks. Could you put that slide up a little bit? The bottom axis is reliability. So that axis will change depending on your climate scenarios. So yes. are you far enough along to, to look at that in the different climate scenarios? Or does it just change a little bit or could it? change a lot. Look quickly on the slide that is in front of you. Which I don't seem 
to have. Um, but there's two rows there for the gap that it fills, and one is catalog, and one is this R1270, which is the city's adopted climate change scenario. Okay. And if I'm not mistaken, the numbers are pretty similar. They are very similar. Yeah. yeah. They're within 5%. Oh, actually, one is 6%. There. Mm -hmm. Tom, did you get the, the text from Rebecca with that? Yeah, with the other. With Is there another slide? No, it's oh, just this one. The one that. Oh, I, got that, I got that one, yeah. But I still, I think I'm going to need to look these slides over um, in detail later if we can, because <laughs> I just, you know, it's a lot to process. Yeah, we'll share this at the end. I think, Heidi, on that one, that slide that we just had, it's it's actually has so much information. It's probably one of my favorite slides of the presentation because it has summarized the different portfolios that Heidi just went through for the three and then it shows the reliability, which primarily I think is either the source of water reliability or how the impacts of climate change and then cost without spending too much emphasis on cost, but just showing the rough order of magnitude of comparison between them. I think the one thing to point out is these are all in 2024 dollars. And so if you look out projects that, you know, need planning or are out there in the future, it also does would need to include the timing element as well as the class estimate based upon the development of the project. Can I ask a question about like the, like I'm looking at 1A, 1B, 1C, 1E, and 1D. Is the difference between those the level of reliance on ASR versus expansion of pure water SoCal? Um, do C and D? rely on expansion of pure water SoCal. D is the one where we're transferring water from the district to the city at 5 MGD-ish. So it's not an insignificant transfer volume, but that's those are the fundamental changes is okay. yes. Um, increasing the size of ASR, I think up to two additional wells, so six, increasing uh, pure water SoCal to five. Two more injection wells. Two more injection wells. And then really increasing the distribution systems of both the city and the district to be able to handle that five MGD water okay. transfer. And that Great. that one E, if I'm reading it correctly, the one, one the outlier is the one with the different distribution system. Um, I think I it's, mean, it's an outlier. It's like. It is an outlier. It's more expensive, but you're. Not getting, you know, more reliability. Three. Um, we'll throw that one out. <laughs> um, it's interesting too, looking at you know the details with respect to well, this one has um, two more ASR wells. Ah. That's significant, both in terms of cost and trying to cite them and. We, you know, we've been looking at ASR for eight years now and going through piloting and demonstration and incorporating them into our distribution system. And it takes a long time to do that, that work. Um, yeah. I think also to Melanie's point, um, when we're talking about escalating these costs, it's almost like, well, where do you escalate them to? Because you know that you have a desal project that the midpoint of construction is going to be eight years out. Whereas if we build out ASR, it's going to be four years out. Um, another reason why I stripped the cost out, because it's just right now it's yeah. too up in the air. Um, I wanted to point out this bit also of information, and we're trying to carry this theme forward, and I think it's important to do that, where the notion of curtailments, particularly for our agency and certainly your agency, where our, our uh, per capita demand is so low, this cost is significant to get it even lower during a drought, and it's recurring. And those are themes that I think we really need to talk about. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe you curtail once, but you're spending a lot of money, and you may have to do it again. And that's really important for people to know. What are you gonna ask? Not to complicate an already complicated decision or decisions, but there's no time axis on this, like you pointed out, yeah. not only an escalation of costs, but when's the next drought? And what what what's the thinking of the city on how many years out is acceptable for it to have the, 
the new sources. Yeah, I um, am really relying on the policy, which again said 2032 is not the drought, but that's when we want supply reliability. Um, it is worrisome that we continue to question climate change and source water reliability in a region where we're dependent on our own sources and it's rainfall driven. My goal is to focus on um, supply reliability and the unknown. And I have heard recently that, well, the drought's not coming for 10 years and I'm not sure where that information came from, but I'm thinking it could be this year and followed by another one. So that was my, my question too, why, why 2030? Because this is- 2032, right? 2032, mm -hmm. I thought it said 2030. Um, it's pretty complicated to get all of those up to, to get to that 100%. Um, up to speed, you know, the more complicated it is, the longer it is. I mean, what, one real quick analysis is that um, anything that's going to take too long falls off the table. Yeah. Which would be the purples and the blues. Well, unless that 2032 is somewhat arbitrary. Um, I think it was, it was established during the Water Supply Advisory Committee, so 2015. It was a bit arbitrary, but it also thought about the fact that it does take a long time to do these projects. So in, in 2015, giving us, what is that, 17 years, 17 years. Um, I am going to keep it until told otherwise, because without that stake, we just keep pushing it out further. That's a good idea. Yeah, I'm not criticizing. I was just wondering if there was some. I mean, because for sure there's going to be a drought. Yeah. Before. I mean, we had the goal for pure water. So we're not. It's not for the drought thing. It's for long-term sustainability. It sounds like you're getting pushback on climate change. No. And the Santa Cruz. <laughs> no, it sounds, sounds like. I, I, I don't know. I'm not saying it's pushback. I'm hearing, right, this questioning around, well, whenever climate change, and we don't know when that is. And I, I think it's going to be important to shift that from away from we don't know, because that makes it sound like we have lots of time, and change it to we don't know, but we have to aim for this nearer term point in time to make sure we have supply reliability. Um, some of the modeling work that we've done with the climate scenario that we use shows that the city is short 50% in some of these scenarios that are in front of us, and that's multiple years, and that would be very challenging to manage and to recover from. Yeah. I think it's like for the district when we were doing our water supply planning, the basin was declared critically overdrafted, one of 21 basins in the state said, you have to do something. So the target was not moving. They, the state set a 2040 goal. We worked backwards and the board set a timeline themselves that we used. I think for the city, I think the, the policy and the 2015 WASAP um, process has set the timeline and now you guys are working backwards with a climate change um, models that kind of new ones come and then do you integrate it or do you continue with that path because it's not as concrete as the state declaring <laughs> you, you, you're unsustainable, right? You, you're kind of defining the tolerance of the, the drought. Um, we, at the Water Commission meeting, we, we shared, we reminded them and us of all the different criteria that we have in front of us to evaluate in terms of selecting projects. And we suggested that we remove some of them for the time being um, because they were either pass-fail or we knew that we wouldn't be pursuing a project for example, if it wasn't adding to our water supply portfolio, that as an example was one of the alternatives. These are some of the ones that were left. Um, one of the ones that was put back on was energy and greenhouse gas impacts. And um, 
as, as we know, they're all including modern, um, more traditional treatments. So that, for example, the city's groundwater water treatment plant, is a very robust treatment process, and it has a large energy and greenhouse gas footprint. So um, the conversation was, well, every treatment and pumping water around is going to have a big footprint. Um, but the interest of the Water Commission, and I don't disagree, is to bring it back into the conversation so that we can highlight that it's currently a big energy footprint. And here's what the additional projects would add. And how do we mitigate for that? Is it through 3CE or how do we do that? So we are going to bring that back into the conversation. But this is some of the um, alternatives that were left. And I just kind of drafted this, and I've had some feedback already. It's, it's a draft, and I should have put draft on here. I did say potential. Um, but it's just some of the things that we're thinking about. So based on performance is differing from the modeling. Um, we've modeled pure water SoCal and ASR. We've modeled recovery with water transfers, but we won't know until we're seeing the performance of the basin. Um, and that could be really in our favor and not in our favor. And then what is the, um, what is the timeline that we give ourselves to say, for example, for the city, okay, your ASR project, you have two wells, it's performing to this level. When do we say it's a good time to add two more wells at another $25 million? Um, so those are some big open questions. And I think also with Pure Water Soquel and the success of that project, and at what point do we say, do you say, the Pure Water Soquel project has met its objectives or we know enough about the performance that we can expand it we can increase water transfers to the city um, and add more injection wells. So those are some of the questions that we're coming up with to ask ourselves and to ask, um, ask the district, but also ask our um, engineers and scientists to help us think through. Um, Shelly pointed out earlier one, and I think I wanted to, was it this one, Shelly? Reliable source water availability. Um, and I, we have D-cell here is the only one that has a reliable source water availability. And I think that can be talked about, but that to me goes back to that comment about that I made about surface water is source limited and wastewater has a ceiling. Now, maybe the ceiling's high enough for us, but we have to ask ourselves that question and know and, take, and have confidence that we have enough of those sources to really rely on for a reliable water supply. And here's our next steps. And here's really the only thing that we need to look at on this slide, <laughs> maybe out here. Um, the policy indicated that we'd have 500 million gallons a year of additional supply by 2027, and then water security by 2032. And our immediate next steps is we're working with um, Kennedy Jenks and um, our CEQA team to develop a roadmap, a roadmap that would likely start with a portfolio one or ASR specifically and incorporate some of these questions that we're asking ourselves about wh when do you add two more ASR wells? When do you expand Pure Water SoCal? When do you shift to DPR? When do you shift to desal? So it'll be, it needs to be pretty detailed in that it helps us pivot so that we can make that 2032 target, if possible. I think going back to that slide before, and you look at that and go, of those challenges or opportunities, where can you work towards to get to 2032, right? Mm -hmm. The permitting, can you answer that within, say, if you know it's gonna take from design and construction four to seven years, you'd need to have all your permitting done, you know, back it out and then be like, is that, can I work with that? And then I think for kind of talking with, with our board related to the ones that relate to SoCal or Pure Water SoCal, I think you pointed out, you know, the really good ones for us to contemplate, which is what are the drivers or what is needed to show basin performance? to be able to engage in uh, the interagency agreements. Yeah, 
Yeah. So could could you go back to one of your slides that has um, the pure water SoCal at five million gallons per day? I guess it's in different. It's a few back. It's on this. Is it? It must be my portfolio yeah. one. Yeah, this one. Um. Oh, you, um, it could be optimization. It's, 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 it's the optimization. So it was a later, okay. Yeah, so the optimization study maxed out transfers to five, <laughs> and then the portfolios limited it to this number. Transfers, Scotts Valley. Where am I missing? Transfers, SoCal to city. The, okay. the pink... Um, and you can see in these. So, so your table has in the alternatives of SoCal to the city of you go up, five and a half million gallons a day. The, but this one. There was a table, yeah. The, the table I, matches this, right? The handout. But I, yeah. I had a question so it, about that. Sorry, sorry, Tom. Let me just finish. No, we're done. So, we're so isn't the capacity even of pure water SoCal twice what it is now, so 2.6 is the max. So you can't go to 5 million even with expansion, or is there something I don't know about? The limiting factor when Heidi's uh, city was doing their portfolio evaluation isn't necessarily the limitation of Pure Water SoCal expanded to double capacity. It's the pipeline infrastructure that connects the two agencies. That's the hydraulic modeling, right? Analysis, the pipelines, and the. I'm sorry, I want to. I'm stuck on the 2.6. What's the 2.6? 2.6 is expand. So the A last alternative, yeah, the last alternative, which is you're expanding pure water. So Cal alternatives A and B look at 1,500 acre foot per year, and then alternatives C and D incrementally increase it, but not to the full amount. And you didn't need the full amount because really as we start looking at it, it's it's the pipeline infrastructure that we were getting bottlenecked from. I guess I totally don't understand it. So the, the I, plant will produce 5.5 million gallons a day? No, um, because it's relying on banking. So the drought that requires 5.3 million gallons a day of water transfers is only once every decade. And so in the meantime, we're doing all this injection of the 2.6 or the 1.9, whatever we expand pure water so fill to, but we bank sufficient water so that it's available for transfers up to five back to the city. So the project's not getting that big. The intertie and the, the distribution systems are getting that big to be able to accommodate that. And where's the water a, coming from? The ground. Number question. Because it looked like somewhere on one of the slides said that you need 500 million gallons per year, which, right? So per day, isn't that around 1.3 million gallons per day, which would be the extra capacity of your water SoCal? So the 500 is an incremental step to supply reliability. Okay. Um, and that was the 2027 number. And it was, again, just to put a milestone out there for us to complete projects. Um, okay. The thinking was that that goal could be, could be met through ASR and um, transfers of one MGD with SoCal and Scotts Valley. Um, I think back to the, so this, this slide, um, this water is groundwater, and it's it's um, sourced from injections from Pure Water SoCal. And so over time, um, there's enough water in the basin so that when the city needs a 5 MGD amount of water back, it's there for the summer. It's not all the time, and it's only in the summer months. It's available to send back to the city. So that gets to the point of whether the models 
are accurate or not. And so I take it you've probably done modeling and assumed a certain amount of leakage of the basin. Yeah. And that will be a key thing. Yeah. yeah. How much it's really leaking. Yeah. And I think all of our eyes got really big when we said five, five MGD back to the city is a big number. Um, it had been modeled. It also assumes five wells for the six wells for the city and five wells for the district injection. Um, and C and D. Yeah. And what interestingly enough, what happened in the development of the portfolios is we reduced the size of pure water, of the transfer because we wanted to say, what if we just kept the cost of the transfers at the existing one MGD? And Cameron was the one that said, you can't, the basin can't handle that because if you're still putting in five injection wells for the district and six ASR wells, you have to also get the water out of the ground. Um, so there has been modeling to demonstrate that the basin can handle it, but it also needs to utilize it. Wasn't that the part, part of the problem with the Santa Margarita studies that they did on their, you know, injecting into the basin? Yeah, a little bit different scenario because it's more of a bowl, but there was so much injection happening in the modeling that it was spilling out into the creeks. Yeah, I remember a presentation okay. on that. What are you still? Okay. So I know, I know these are really, you know, first steps, but um, does basin sustainability get evaluated in any of the scenarios? Yes, all of them. And I, don't, I think the only ones we carried forward were those that achieved basin sustainability as a first priority. And so what's the, the four alternatives that we selected based on basin sustainability, um, ability to fill the su city supply gap, and just um, re not reliability, uh, feasibility mm -hmm. was another criteria. So these were the four that were selected um, to be further evaluated for water quality impacts, cost, um, economic, uh, environmental. environmental permitting requirements. Um, Sounds like a good thing. How's basin sustainability defined? Um, it's, it's already, we're already meeting basin sustainability with the projects, Pure Water SoCal at 1500 and the city's ASR wells at four ASR wells, those already meet sustainability. So we're really, I guess, kind of looking at this is the icing on top of that um, is, yeah. But I, so I we think have groundwater levels below sea level yeah. and it's, we're meeting sustainability. We, I have a different definition of sustainability. Well, I think just to, um, with, the, with the project being funded um, through the SIG, Sustainable Groundwater Management Grant. That was the, the, I think the important thing to always remember and to carry through in terms of the basin sustainability and the criteria under the groundwater sustainability plan. So building upon having to meet all of the metrics of the basin management objectives um, for water levels and water qualities and meeting those annual and five year increments and building upon the inputs on the model, and I think we've all recognized that's a model and we would have to ensure that we meet every annual um, plan and every five-year increment till we meet basin sustainability. We're gonna be looking, that's the grade book, right? That's the um, criteria that we would have to identify, not just with uh, Sigma, but also you know, the grant that we received, we have performance indicators that we have to show, and I think what Shelley was saying is as we were looking at the project and as we were looking at reduced demands and we're looking at when we did do the modeling, we had a huge increase over the protected water levels that there was this opportunity for optimizing or um, I think improving the regional benefits. And that's kind of that, that gray area between what we model and what will be and then what the basin needs, and then what the city could use. Okay, it's it's so. To rephrase it, it's not that we have a sustainable basin, but we're making progress towards a sustainable basin. Mm -hmm. 
that's that's the metric that you're that was your we we had to be making progress towards sustainability over so, the um, 20 year time frame Montgomery and Associates looked at all of these alternatives through the groundwater model if we we do this what is the impact on both water levels and chloride mm -hmm. you know how how close are we to like how much extra protection do we have above those levels um, so I guess we looked at the relativity of the basin sustainability and mm -hmm. but everything we moved forward um, meets that and and they must have assumed a certain climate too because the yeah they use recharge the catalog, catalog that was used in the GSP um, with some updates and then we also did modeling using the city's 1270 climate model and there wasn't from what I remember there wasn't a lot of difference there in the results all right I think I understand what's going on good good luck <laughs> to all of us to all of us I just yeah. unless there's another question I just want to focus on our next steps again that um we are developing this implementation guide and like Melanie said, my goal is to put the stake in the ground at 2020, 2032 and work backwards um, and see what that leaves on the table and how much work we have to do to get there. Um, um, we're obviously also developing a public engagement. We're hoping to take this work, the WASAP, to our city council in the spring of next year. Um, and then, of course, high on our list is identifying when we need to engage with our partners um, on which projects and kind of what that conversation looks like to make sure that um, we make the best use of the work coming out of the optimization study and the projects that are in development. All right. Well, thank you. We don't have public, so we don't need public comment on this. It's hey, thank you very much, Heidi. I feel like I got a long way to go to understand it well, but that's a good start. Good. Thank you. I agree, Tom. Were there any more? We kind of asked questions as we, we. Thanks, Heidi. Heidi, one thing we should just share with you because we did present this at our water advisory committee meeting, just about more of an update to the optimization study than the WASAP was the conversation around cost, which I think is a good, um, I think it was a good move that you were like, let's not focus too much on cost. When we were just talking with it to our water advisory committee, they thought that it was gonna be cost incurred by the district. And so they were hearing these hundred and something million dollars that how is the district gonna pay for that? So again, as we go into that public engagement, that, that is something that our ratepayers were like going, wait, now you're going to be doing an optimization project on your pure water project that we have, you know, incurred costs on. So, thank you. Good night. All right, so that was 7.3, and uh, that brings us to 7.4. Provide direction and select committee for Pure Water SoCal concrete tank architectural screening. And this is you, right, Becca? And Tosh. Tosh. Okay, both of you. Glad to, glad to see it. Well, um, I think. For everyone that has been to the uh, AWPF, the Chanticleer Pure Water Soquel um, treatment facility, um, there are some large blue perforated panels that are intended to help screen the, the concrete tanks. There are three concrete tanks and some tanks have multiple screens on them. And when this was presented to us as a, as a solution to, to somewhat screen the tanks, 
there was a, you know, art presented and there are some images on the blue panels that um, some people, some people have not seen very clearly. And so um, what we've asked uh, the design builder to do is to, you know, provide some alternatives to help make the, the art a little more visible. And this came to light, you know, after the uh, Regional Transportation Commission put up the art on the bike pedestrian bridge adjacent to the facility um, with very bold uh, images of whales. Um, and so we would like to um, get your feedback and, and only if needed, you can form, um, you know, a committee of two board members. Uh, maybe it wouldn't be a bad idea in case we have to go back and forth uh, with the design builder. So I do want to maybe keep that on the board. But Becca has some some options that, you know, we were working together with um, the design builder's architect, who's um, shared a few options with us. Um, the goal is to um, not necessarily, you know, start over from scratch. Uh, try to to leverage what we have, which is, you know, a very robust um, constructed screen. Then maybe just accent it. Um, you know, one thing that you will notice if you're there on a sunny day is that the the framework that holds the blue panels up can get very bright and shiny. And, and it does take away from the visual, you know, right, the, the benefit of the, the blue just gets kind of washed out with a, and I think we have some images there for, for sharing with you. Um, and I can bring that up, I like, believe. On it's on your computer. computer. So, um, I will zoom in, yes. All right. I mean, a quick question, and I'm curious if the whoever the subcontractor that was responsible for this is to going to take any responsibility for correcting it. Uh, that is yet to be determined, and and you know we're we're trying to first get to acknowledgement that that something needs to get done, and then we'll we'll work on cost later, but. I mean, have they looked at it? Um, yes, they have made site visits, and okay. um, it's obvious. Okay. Well, yeah, I think their story is that it it's intended to be a. They use the word self discovery, um, and that it takes time to, you know, look at the panels and and realize, oh, there's an otter there. Oh, there's a surfer there. There's an octopus. Horse feathers. Okay. We will uh, we'll just work towards a solution, and I think you know we 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 do have the attention of the design builder. We have the attention of the the architect who presented this to us initially, and I I think um, you know it's it's low on the priority currently because you know they're they're working on startup activities, but it is it is in our court now to you know give a little more feedback, more formal feedback on, on what we would like to see here. The, the three photos that you see on the screen are, are what they look like today. Um, on the left is the purified tank and it has a, uh, yeah, a surfer and some birds and a wave, um, that in this instance, thanks for letting me know about that. I still don't see it. Okay. <laughs> and, and at the time this photo was taken, we had, you know, tried to explore other solutions. And in this instance, the left side of the, the panels has, has a tarp behind it. As mm. you, as you look at this, the mm. right side of that screen, you can see through it and you can see the, the structure of the frame. And one, you know, solution was, is would it be better to have a solid background, uh, a darker background? And, you know, it does add, it adds value, but I'm not sure it really helps the visual image because what it does do is it highlights the frame behind it. You almost see the grid more. So 
Uh, anyways, we're here to just look at what they look like today. Uh, the top right is is an octopus um, on top of the um, ROC reverse osmosis contact tank, con uh, concentrate tank, and then at the bottom right is the uh, MF feed tank, where there's an otter to the right. <laughs> it's a roar shock test. Is that, do you have the ori uh, original drawings that yeah, we were that showing? Yeah, that they, that they, that they said what, what it really would look like. like. We yeah. do. Okay. I think the difference is that what they presented didn't take an effect that the sky, that they'd be seen through to the sky. They didn't take that lighting effect when they presented it originally. It would be interesting for us to see that. Yeah. Well, you're going to see part of it on the next slide. So, um, this so the bike ped went up, and you know the whales are a huge hit across the community. So, taking that as inspiration, I went ahead and kept within the theme of what these screens already have on there. You can go to the next slide and use the black cutouts to create images to put onto the blue. So we kept the surfer, and then we added some birds to the other side. And, and Tom, to address your point, the upper images, <clears throat> if you were to, you know, take away the black uh, silhouettes, are are the images that were presented to the district as a, a CAD CAD version. Right. What the screens would be. What the screen would look like when installed, and I, I like Becca mentioned. Um, you know, the, the framework is not visible um, in these rendering. Well, you yeah, call them rendering, but they're actually the CAD drawings that were used to um, to fabricate the, the panels. And then this, the fact that the sky uh, behind it is not helpful in some views. The contrast was so much more relevant in the drawings that we were presented when we were going through the design effort. Than how they turned out. Yes. Yeah. So we were misled. Yeah. So this is. I don't remember actually seeing these before they seeing the designs before they. Went. Oh, I didn't see them either. Um, I would have I definitely. A very, uh, um, feedback about the bicycle path, though, that might have some impact. Um, a number of people who I've talked to, ask him how they liked it. Mm -hmm just to get, get information on our building, our building. And they said, they thought it was a little distracting. It was, you know, it was the highway, people are really going fast. I'm not sure we need too much detail. I was just wondering if we just, uh, like, let the sky show through. Or what is the purpose of the screens in the first place? To screen the tanks that are behind it. Yeah, but there's... You can see tanks below it, though. Yeah. There's piping. All the infrastructure. There is a tank on the purified. Yeah, there, I mean, it doesn't camouflage the tanks, especially. It just, uh, I thought it was nice to have a color, some color there. You know, especially blue because water and so on. But I'm not sure about, I didn't know there was a surf, surf in there, to be honest. <laughs> so, but the birds actually, and I didn't know there were birds either, but if you're going to put anything like ostensibly a deterrent for um, birds flying into the screens because they, or something, um, accidentally, then maybe just putting some hard outlines there to just let it, let birds know that they're. I don't think that's actually been a problem. Yeah, so I don't think so either. I don't just, I'm. Uh, do you have other visuals? We do. We have the other tanks that we can scroll through. <laughs> I mean, the octopus. That's a neat figurative design, but it doesn't have that much to do with water. It's an ocean. Well, the great the octopus does live here in the bay, and mm -hmm. so a lot of these images were animals that lived in the bay. Mm -hmm. um, and our thought was going forward that we'd have on the bridge. If you could see the, the pictures that were on these screens, signage that explains mm -hmm. 
what's on the screens and also, you know, hopefully we'll have signage that talks about Pure Water Soquel in general, what's going on. But it was, it was like the art element, you know, Santa Cruz loves their art. The murals are all over the county and it was a way to add to that. You, do we know how much that costs to put those up? We do not yet. Yeah, I mean, not the new one, but the old one. Oh, the old ones? We do, but I don't know off the top of my head. 140,000. 140, because I think one of the things, and just to kind of clarify, we talk about these as the ROC wet well, <clears throat> the microfiltration feed tank, and then the purified water tank. That is basically, you know, that, that whole structure. Because the site is tight and um, space constrained, there's a lot of equipment, um, piping, et cetera, above the concrete, which is why those were screened. If you took the, the, the blue screens off, you'd be seeing a lot of industrial, industrial pipes. looking piping. And that was the intent of the screening, as well as to tie in um, an art element to, to the facility. That's a good idea. I'm just not sure how much more we should spend on it. Right. And I, I think that's, that is the, the program's team, team's uh, challenge right now. And we hear both, both you and, and Director LaHue questioning the cost. And Taj has, has you know, expressed that right now we are talking to the design builder on, did this meet um, the intent? Um, and what was proposed during the original design and collaboration that we were doing at the beginning of the project. I, mean, I was thinking more like keeping it really simple, just waves or water, or, you know, some. So does it, aquatic does it have to be a uh, screen or can it be solid? It can be solid. The frame behind these was designed for a solid screen. So the wind loading, um, can not impact the decision if you if you guys want to explore something like a solid screen. Well, as a mural, like an actual mural, like something our community could contribute to. Perhaps. Yeah. Do you want to see the last one, or yes. there's one more tank? Yeah, I'm let's sure. see the last. Let's see the otter. So we didn't cover the otter space because we couldn't figure out a silhouette of an otter that didn't look cartoonish. I tried and tried. And it's the one screen that we have been told over and over that self-discovery has helped it happened. And they're like, oh, I saw the otter today when I was driving by. So instead of covering the face, we decided to go with pelicans to just kind of augment and enhance it. And so you can still have that self-discovery, but there's it, it, the continuity um, continues with the other screens in the black. Okay. There's no public. So the idea, the idea is to put something on top of it to allow that black to show up. Is Correct. That like I mean? black metal panels like the whales are on the bike ped bridge. Okay. The, con the concepts were with the kind of, I think, guiding principles that staff and um, working with the design builder was to leave the existing panels since they were there and not change out the panels yeah. in this, you know, proposal of design modifications to incorporate the design elements of the RTC, but not fully replicate it. That's why you don't just see all of the whales that the RTC use and then just the same whales on ours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but we also did, yeah. To, to, so so let's, let's talk about those as a board. Yeah. But I think the so one the that, first, first thing you said, Melanie, I'd like to get feedback from the directors is, you know, to leave what's there. Um, is there agreement on that, that we leave what's there and modify either slightly or greatly? Yes. I I don't think we want to take those screens off. I think okay. they have value. So I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, I think the images nice. just need to be and more the, visual. And then the second Whatever thing, thing that... Choose, I think an ocean theme is fine, but I think yeah. leaving them there 
is the way to go. Yeah. Now. And then the second thing you said, Melanie, was uh, not to replicate what RTC has done. Is there with the whales specifically? With the whales, yeah. Yes, definitely. I, I Same. You agree? Yeah. A dolphin would be fine, and I definitely want a female surfer, not a male surfer. Okay. I can throw some hair on that surfer. Or two surfers. Ponytail. Could be a male with a ponytail. Careful. Um, so the, so those, and your third thing? The third thing was, and and kind of at the initial staff level, we talked about painting it. We talked about murals. We talked about color on on the metal screens as well as on the concrete. Um, the feedback that Taj had provided was maintenance and long-term. Mm -hmm. um, just kind of trying to put something up there. there it's hard to access and that there were some challenges probably long-term if we were to do something where there was paint. Um, the other feedback we got was to try to not be, not too matchy-matchy in terms of the RTC and also don't clash too much and to try to integrate a, a theme right there. So, okay. any feedback from the board on those thoughts? I, I have a. There's no way to have like the Pure Water SoCal logo on one of them, right? We would love that, but that was the part where, um, as a group, we were like, "Well, butterflies and the the ocean theme." Um, but yeah. I don't know, Becca. But our butterfly. I mean. I guess it birds. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, that I mean, might be more over the seagulls or the. Right. We could make it large enough to go over the surfer so you don't. The rest just kind of looks. The surfer is just not related. Okay. So we've got some ideas. Um, let me pull up. I just like to tie it more. There's the motion. If we're going to actually see it, I would like to see it tied more to the actual. Um, we have a lot of great artwork. I think, I think Bruce, you're trying to get to the fact of okay, we got. Are a few we basic are we going to have? Started, are we going to have directors we involved? Have final decision tonight. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> At least Tom. I volunteer, Tom. <laughs> yeah, you can't do that. But <laughs> I volunteer if you're going to do it. I do. Are you? So you're interested in being on the committee? Or? Yes. Okay, Carla. And one other. That doesn't mean we have to have it. I mean, I'd be happy to. Okay. Looks like you can volunteer, Tom. <laughs> I don't know. You tell me. I, I, whatever. Got him at a bad moment. Right. Okay. So I guess we're going to, 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 we've done one, but I don't think we want a motion on it. Let's just trust the committee is mine to, you know, to appoint a committee and and let them decide. Does that? I actually think I was reading. Can you put the motions on it? I think it could be both because you're basically saying we just want consensus that we're going to move forward with modifying these these panels. Okay. Yeah. yeah, we're not. It's not details. Right. You're and right. And then two, right. you guys have, um, I think, identified Director Christian. So, Lahue. motions one and two. Anybody going to make? Both of them. Yeah. Anybody going to make motions one and two? I will. <laughs> Is there a second? Second. Okay. okay. Roll call. Director LeHue? Yes. Director Balboni? Yep. Director Christensen? Yes. And President Jaffe? Yes. Okay, we're done with that. Oh, Josh, I forgot to ask for public comment. But there's no public here. So, Should I cover my tracks in some way? We're okay. There, there's there's no public in the audience. Okay. So. All right. All right. So that ends the uh, open part of the meeting. And we're going to adjourn to closed session. Or not adjourn. We're going to go into closed session and then come back for adjournment. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.